Hello, and thank you for joining our Water Wise Landscaping Good for People, Birds, and Rivers webinar. I am your host, Abby Burke, the Western Rivers Outreach Specialist for Audubon Rockies, a regional office of the National Audubon Society. I would like to introduce to you today my friend and our presenter, Jamie Weiss. Jamie is the Habitat Hero Coordinator for Audubon Rockies, based out of the regional office in Fort Collins. Along with her bachelor degree in marine biology and chemistry from University of North Carolina, Wilmington, Jamie is a certified interpretive guide as appointed by the National Association of Interpretation. Jamie previously worked at Boyd Lake State Park and the Georgia Aquarium as an educational interpreter, providing families and individuals of all ages an awareness of conservation. She also has been newly appointed to serve on the Climate Action Plan Committee for the City of Fort Collins, working on updating their land and water use policies. When not working, she is often leading an active lifestyle, trying to keep up with her deaf border collie and golden retriever. She enjoys working in her own garden, hiking, particularly the big 14ers, camping, horseback riding, snowboarding, and is an avid fan of long distance running. Jamie is excited to be a part of the Audubon Rockies team to help bring conservation home one garden at a time. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing your expertise with us today. So let's get right to it since we have lots to present to you today. Jamie, could you please advance one slide? Your phone lines have been muted since we have a large number of participants today. We will engage questions after the main presentation of today's webinar. Please use the chat feature on your screen to type your messages or questions directly to me, and you can do this throughout the session. Thanks again for joining, and let's dive in. So Jamie, when you're ready, my friend, the stage is yours. Gabby, thank you so much for that great introduction, and I appreciate all of you for spending time and taking time out of your busy work day, and it's so fun to be able to I uh, talk with you over the lunch break and talk to you about how you can become a habitat hero and create gardens that are water wise but are also good for people, birds, and our rivers. I'm just going to set the stage for a few minutes and provide a little bit of background and context of the Habitat Hero program and the way Audubon works. And then we'll jump right in uh, in learning about how you, we're going to provide opportunities for you community members to lend a helping hand in creating these water-wise gardens. Our Habitat Hero Program provides the resources to help in planning water-wise gardens that not only provide habitat, but attracts birds, bees, butterflies, and an array of pollinators. We're working with not only landowners, but community members and community leaders to provide them these local opportunities to create habitat for wildlife. Our program has been around since, since 2014, and we're encouraging these people to become habitat heroes or to practice this form of landscape stewardship we like to coin as wildscaping. And whether the landscape you tend to is a typical residential front yard or backyard, it could be even in a smaller space, a few potted plants on a balcony, a public park, or even a schoolyard garden. But regardless of the size or the design, the whole idea is all of these people or habitat heroes are helping to grow a healthier community. Being a regional office of the National Audubon Society, we do cover both territories in Colorado and in Wyoming, and we engage these people with a variety of platforms, whether that be through workshops and presentations for both adults and youth. We also have a fantastic website that just got a facelift with a lot of information on example gardens, gardening how-tos and tips and techniques and plant sources, example gardens, and more. We'll talk a little bit more about our website a little later on. We also have our social media platforms, and then our two biggies, our community planting, providing those opportunities for community members to lend a helping hand through gardening projects, planting those demonstration gardens, and also a recognition through awards. Hence this beautiful photo featured up here. This is a 2014 Habitat Hero Awardee for their outstanding residential landscape in Littleton, Colorado. And as you can see, this is a garden that's not only beautiful, it's also providing that essential habitat. 
So I like to look at the big picture. So before I talk about what you can actually do in your yard, I like to provide a little bit of context. And this is how Audubon works. National Audubon is a birding conservation that was founded in 1905. And it's our, through a mission of science, education, policy, and on-the-ground conservation, we protect birds and their habitat. This photo is taken from Audubon's strategic plan. And when we think about protecting birds, we actually need to think about their whole migratory flyway and protecting birds everywhere that they go throughout their lives. They face many challenges at their breeding grounds, their wintering grounds, or along migration. So by providing habitat for wildlife, we can not only feel good about doing something positive for ourselves, we are helping the environment and our feathered flyway friends by combating the loss of habitat and creating those green corridors that link your wildscape to those larger natural areas. So what does a Habitat Hero Wildscape include? You know, that's a talk for another day, a different presentation when we're looking at all of those components that make up a bird-friendly yard. But I do like to have this bulleted list of the things that we're looking at in a Habitat Hero Garden with today's emphasis on the water-wide portion. But a Habitat Hero Garden also includes a diversity of layers. Looking at that horizontal and vertical structure, diversity in textures and color in bloom time, all through the use of native plants. We'll talk about native plants and regionally adapted plants in a little bit more detail. But the reason they're so great for our landscapes is that they co-evolved with our harsh climate and with our demanding water needs out here in the arid west. And native plants also attract native, blood, native bugs and support our local food web. Habitat Hero Gardens also provide shelter and nesting opportunities and offer food and water sources. We're also controlling invasive plants in a two-fold fashion, both through weeding, so going out into your garden and removing plants that don't belong, and also as you're going to your garden centers and nurseries, requesting those plants that are native or regionally adapted instead of introducing more alien species into our landscape. And lastly, we're eliminating or at least reducing our chemicals and fertilizer usage. So I'm going to run through this uh, series of pictures. We're going to look at housing density units. Uh, from This is a picture in 1940. And just to orient yourself with the map, the areas that are dark green or black are the areas with the lowest housing density units. And the areas that are red or orange are your highest density units. And you can see back in 1940, these isolated core areas are surrounded by small farms or open land. What we're going to do, we're going to look at this through a series of time and jump through the decade all the way up until the present time and with a projected growth at 2030. I'll run through the map one time with me kind of narrating and then one time just me uh, being quiet and you can then focus on maybe a particular area which you live in or uh, the eastern seaboard being the tremendous growth. But here in 1950, you can see decade by decade, this relatively consolidated urban areas have now spilled out into the surrounding landscapes. 1970, we're mowing down more and more of the essential habitat. We're converting million of acres into housing developments. Here's year 2000, more and more urban sprawl. And now you can see here in 2010, within this decade, the eastern half of the country has seen tremendous increase in housing density. And it's only going to get worse. Here's the projected density of housing units by the year of 2030, just a mere 15 years from now. We have lost a staggering 150 million acres of ecologically productive land to urban, straw, urban sprawl. We have taken this rich, contiguous landscape of ecologically healthy land, and we've lost about 52% of that to agriculture, and another 43% has been developed in what I like to call the suburban urban matrix. So I'll just run through the series one more time without me narrating. So pick a spot maybe in Colorado or a place on the eastern seaboard, and it really is impressive to see the housing density increase.
Pretty shocking, huh? Well, Colorado, we're home to more than 5.3 million people, with the majority of people on the front range, about 80% of us living on that eastern third of Colorado. We're also home to 35,000 different types of insects, including about 1,000 different native bee species, and also more than 450 varieties of birds. So this program is really more than creating gardens. It's really looking at landscape scale conservation. With habitat loss being the number one cause of endangerment of species in the United States, you have the opportunity to set aside a little piece of habitat for birds and other wildlife right in your own yard, helping to stitch back the landscape one garden at a time. You know, for over 100 years, Audubon has really focused on protecting birds in critical habitat, sanctuaries, important bird areas, national parks, but it's becoming increasingly clear to us that we also have to work in cities and towns. This is where most people live. So what is this connection between urban sprawl and this loss of habitat have anything to do with gardening and water savings? Well, this is how. Those orange and red areas on the map, this is what the average landscape looks like in America. As mentioned, 43% of that um, the land has now been developed into the suburban urban matrix. And this is what the average American yard looks like, this monoculture of turf grass. You know, some shade trees here and there, and a lot of alien plant species. It's neat, it's simple, but it's also lifeless. This landscape was developed for convenience and to celebrate lawn as a status symbol. On average, these yards cover more than half that are dominated by turf grass, and only a fifth is covered by trees, flowers, and shrubs, with the majority of them being alien or introduced species. Lawns are fairly sterile, and they're extremely water thirsty. They also provide little to no ecological value. So it's now time to switch from this paradigm and create living landscapes. So according to Denver Water, the average annual use for a typical family home is 125,000 gallons per year. The shocking statistic is that 55% of our water allocation needs is actually for our outdoor use. So not for taking showers and running the dishwasher and doing laundry or brushing our teeth. It's for keeping our lawns looking lush. From an article in the Denver Post in the year 2015, the state faces a 163 billion gallon projected water shortfall by 2050. Today's population of 5.3 million grows to an estimated 10 million people as the industry expands. This threatens to leave 2.5 million people parched. So we're talking about not having enough water for people to drink, let alone having enough water to keep our gardens and our lawns looking lush. So the Habitat Hero program offers this huge opportunity in water savings when we look at constructing gardens that not only support wildlife, but that are water wise. So now we're at the stage that we can actually now look at how to create a garden that provides habitat, is water wise and enjoyable for you and your friends. We're going to look at some water conservation tips looking mainly at how to conserve water in the outdoor use fashion. Also the scoop on turf grass, when to use it, if so, what to use. And we couldn't talk about creating water-wise gardens if we didn't give you some good plant examples. And then I'll also share with you a fantastic Habitat Hero success story. And we'll wrap up with other ways that you can get involved in lead time for about 10, 15 minutes for a Q&A portion. Our strategy is so focused on engaging our network to take action that ensures that there's sufficient water flowing to the most important bird areas and to benefit people, birds, and our local economic interests. All right, so some water conservation tips in the outdoor use. First off, we talked about planting natives. They have co-evolved under our local conditions, and they require less water than exotic plants from foreign climates. You know, out here in the arid west, we get about 15 inches of rainfall. The plants that dominate the landscape out here in the short grass prairie and the foothills can thrive with that amount of moisture once they have become established. 
Water prudently, only when absolutely necessary, and if you do, in the morning when temperatures are cooler to minimize evaporation. A great test to see if your plants need water is to insert a screwdriver into the soil. If the soil gives uh, freely to the screwdriver, you do not need to overwater or water at that time. Another great reason for this is it's a deterrent for animals. What do I mean by that? Just like you and I might want the largest piece of cake on the table, your deer and your rabbits or the other animals that you might not be wanting to eat the vegetation in your garden will always be picking out the plants that are lush and are sweet smelling. And those are the ones that are going to be overwatered. So I just encourage you to water by hand only when absolutely necessary. Mulch around plants for water retention, weed prevention, and also to prevent soil erosion. Some mulches or organic mulches that you can use are compost, wood chips, or straw, and they help replenish the soil as they decay. Also, adding or organic material, such as compost or peat moss, will improve its ability to retain water. The Washington State University Extension found that only a 5% increase in organic material quadruples the soil's water holding capacity. Just a 5% increase in organic material. We, rather than hosing down sidewalks and driveways and other impervious services, the other added bonus is a little bit of outdoor exercise for you. Drip irrigation for trees, shrubs, and flowers. The watering at the roots is more efficient than overhead watering, such as with a sprinkler or a hose. If you do use sprinklers, direct them so that the water reaches only your lawn and garden. You're not watering your driveway or your neighbor's driveway and sidewalk. You can also shut off the timer of your sprinkler system. Use rainwater. Notice how I said not capture it. You know, rain barrels are not quite yet legal in Colorado. We can't capture it, but we can certainly direct that rainwater. So use gravity to your advantage and create those stream beds or rock channels to areas of your garden that might need a little bit more water. You can group plantings with similar water needs, so directing that runoff to a grouping of plants that might be a little bit more higher water use is a great way of taking advantage of that rain that does fall. Mowing, you know, longer grass holds soil moisture better than a shorter lawn, so resist the urge to mow at your usual length, and if you can, wait until a height of at the recommended three inches. And minimize your lawn. Lawns account for a large percentage of our outdoor water use. They are water thirsty. Shrink the size of your lawn by planting native shrubs, trees, and ground cover, specifically extending or expanding your garden border. And that brings me to the scoop on turf grass. I've mentioned that they are water thirsty. They require about two and a half to four times more water than trees and shrubs. So I encourage you to start replacing sections of your lawn, a variety of plants. Your turf does have time and place. It is great for enduring heavy traffic, for kids, for pets, it's a great area for entertaining. But if you are not using that space, I encourage you to plant a variety of plants instead. It will be beautiful, it will provide habitat, and it's more water efficient. If you do need the areas uh, for that play area for your dog runs, uh, for your kids' play area. There are other alternatives. So many of our turf grass lawns are your Kentucky bluegrass lawns. So I encourage you to look at maybe some alternatives. Both buffalo grass and blue grama grass are great alternatives out here in the West. As you can see from the buffalo grass, it requires only 15 to 30 inches of annual rainfall. Whereas your bluegrass, requires 30 to 40 inches of rainfall annually. Buffalo grass comes in two varieties. There's Legacy and 609. The, two, the main differences between them is Legacy greens up early in the spring, but it browns off pretty early in the fall. And 609 is the opposite. It, browns, it stays brown pretty long in the spring, but it extends its season and is green throughout the fall. If you do need to have a grass that can tolerate a little bit more traffic, as you can see the buffalo grass really is meant for a low or moderate use, you could switch from a bluegrass to say a dog tough grass. It's not native, so if you are um, stringent about that, I would not recommend this grass, but the plus 
is that it only requires 15 to 20 inches of rain compared to your bluegrass, which is 30 to 40. And changing a lawn to a low water garden saves about 12,000 gallons of water per year for only a 1,000 square foot area. Additionally, native plants reduce the use of pesticides and they provide that valuable food source for birds. Again, good for people, birds, and our rivers. Now, if you're living in a covenant controlled community and they require you to have X amount of percentage of grass, you now have a leg to stand on because back in 2000, Five, the Senate bill passed saying that an association may not enforce a restrictive covenant that restricts or limits xeriscaping or requires the primary use of turf grass. And we'll be sending that little blurb and that bill out with you in the materials or you can email us for more information on that because that's a great piece of information that you could bring to your president of your HOA or in your covenant controlled community. All right, so this is the past criteria for choosing plants for a landscape. What is beautiful to me? Whereas this should be the future criteria for choosing plants for our landscapes. These pictures are taken or borrowed by Dr. Douglas Tallamy. He is an entomologist and professor at the University of Delaware. Doug Tallamy actually came as our keynote presenter for our workshop uh, back in January at Denver Botanic Gardens. And we really need to look at how to create gardens that offer beauty and function. Ptolemy's work is so important as he's the first guy on the map to really quantify the importance of how and why native plants are critical to the survival and vitality of local ecosystems. And looking at how to bring balance back and looking at what nature has already provided for free food webs and soil retention, carbon sequestration, these are the things that our gardens should be looking like. So restoring native plants to our communities is vital to preserving biodiversity. And each of us can play a role in this new way of landscaping our community. Your patch of habitat now becomes a part of a collective effort to nurture and sustain the living landscape for birds and quality of life. So just like if you were to renovate a room in your house, there's going to be research, there's going to be design work, it's not going to be a weekend project, it's going to take time. Same thing with your backyard, this is not going to be a one weekend project where all of a sudden you strip out all your turf grass and you have 100% wildscape in your yard. It is a process, and it starts by just slowly extending that board out and choosing native plants, slowly reducing that area of lawn, and soon you'll start creating those corridors that connect your garden that support those larger natural areas. And by transforming these lawns to living landscapes, every yard can be a sanctuary for birds and people. So birds and other wildlife have basic needs. That includes food, water, shelter, and places to nest. And to help transform your yard, it is important to plan and provide for all seasons. Again, that's another talk when we're looking at all the components in creating a bird-friendly yard. So for today's purposes, we're just going to focus on the food element in the form of plants and looking at, that, and the, looking at those four different um, plant categories, insects, berries and fruits, nectar, and nuts and seeds. Because we certainly can't talk about designing water-wise gardens if we don't touch on plants. And as a caveat, the plants that I do introduce, those will be here uh, for the front range of Colorado here in the short grass prairie or in the foothills. And that's where the majority of people live that we established earlier on in the conversation. Just like you and I have staples in our pantry so we can throw a quick meal together at any time, these are plants, I'm going to introduce some plants that are staples for any garden out here in the West. They thrive with little moisture, they provide great shelter and food sources, and they tolerate a wide range of growing conditions, making them easy to grow. It's certainly not an exhaustive list, 
it just to give you a few ideas of true and tried favorites. All right, insects. They tell the most compelling story for why need and plants matter. We talked a little bit about them being water-wise and being able to survive only on 15 inches of rainfall a year once they've become established. They also support our local insect populations, which are the foundation of food webs. Insects are also high in protein and essential for growth and development. So native insects eat native plants. Only about 90% of insects that eat plants can only eat the plants with which they have co-evolved with. Meaning they are specialists and they have created relationships with their host plants. The ones that getting the, the one that is getting the most attention right now, I'm sure you all heard, is the monarch and the milkweed. The monarch butterfly as an adult is a generalist. It can feed on many nectar producing plants. It's a in the caterpillar stage where its children are the ones that are specialists and can only be feeding off of its host plant, the milkweed. And there's many reasons, and there's uh, many reasons to why those insects have co-evolved alongside with plants. One could be camouflage. Those caterpillars could blend nicely on the plant so other predators won't be gleaning them off the plant. So could be that toxin resistance or buildup, like in the case of the monarch. Caterpillar can store that toxin in its body tissues, warning off other predators. Other adaptions for getting pollen. Pollen is a prized value for the plant. You don't want anyone just being able to eat that source if they're not going to do it, its services, those pollination services. So there's adaptations in tongue length and vibration in order to get the pollen out of the plant. So the exotic plants that dominate our landscaping industry really for the most part um, are unpalatable to our native insects. And if the insects cannot eat the plants in our landscape, the food chain is essentially broken. The world without insects is a world without biological diversity. Not only is the food web broken, meaning the primary consumers, those plant-eating insects, won't have plants to feed off of, you won't then have your carnivorous insects and then you won't have the animals that eat insects like birds and so on and so forth up the food web. It also impacts humans too. A third of all our food is pollinated by pollinators. So it's essential that we start providing these pollinators the right plants. And we can do this in our very own garden. I told you insects tell a compelling story. So I'm going to share a little story with you about a chickadee. 96% of all terrestrial birds feed their young insects. So even adults that are feeding off of nuts and berries and seeds, when they're rearing their clutch, they're feeding their babies insects. What insects? Majority of them are caterpillars. Caterpillars are fantastic baby bird food. They're soft body, so they're easy to cram down the mouth of the baby bird, and they're packed with protein needed for development. So I'm just going to give a quick example of how many insects is required to rear just one clutch. And this is taken from, again, Douglas County and his research. It was a study actually done back in 1961. It's been replicated again, uh, but it's a fantastic story showing you how many insects are required just to rear one clutch. And again, if you've not heard of Douglas County, I would recommend his book, Bringing Nature Home. It will get you started on your garden in no time. All right, so chickadee. It was they counted mom and dad bringing about 390 to 570 caterpillars to the nest in one day for their clutch. Chickadees feed their young on average about 16 days before they can fledge. Simple math: 570 caterpillars for 16 days is over 9,000 caterpillars, and that's just to rear one family of chickadees. Chickadee only weighs a third of an ounce, a couple pennies worth. So you can extrapolate this example to see how many insects are needed to raise other chickadee families in your neighborhood and larger birds that are going to be insects. To illustrate this example, we're going to look at two different groups of trees. The so one of them is a native oak, or in the genus Quercus, supporting over 537 different species of caterpillars. The one on the right 
is a ginkgo, which is an ornamental plant uh, from Asia, only supporting four species of caterpillars. So when you, are a bird, when you are a bird in search of food for young, this is a life-threatening difference. Academy has shown now the importance of native plants by documenting the number of caterpillars posted by each plant genus. So this list shows the best native genre of trees ranked by the number of caterpillars each group hosts. Now, a little caveat, this research was done in the eastern seaboard where there's deciduous forest and the soil and the rainfall there can support a large amount of trees. So I'm not saying go out now and plant all these trees just because they can support caterpillars. Every plant still needs to have the right growing conditions or preferred growing conditions. So what I am saying is you do have, when you're opting for a plant and it is a cat, uh, it can support a large amount of caterpillars, I would encourage you to plant that one. For an example, the sand cherry. As you saw from the list, that's the third best tree option for sustaining insects. The sand cherry is fantastic out here in the arid west. The smaller shrub, only growing about four feet tall and about four feet wide, it's extremely drought tolerant. And they have these beautiful white fragrant flowers that are attractive to insect pollinators for the early spring, April and May. They also have some edible fruits that are relished by birds. And its native habitat is for dry grasslands and rocky slopes and sandy areas in both the plains and the foothills. In fact, if you overwater it, it will kind of pucker and pucker. So that's to and not overwater this plant. Another great plant in supporting insects out here in the arid west is the hawthorn. This is a small tree or a large shrub, about 20 feet tall, about 15 feet wide. It has a lot of thorns, so it also provides that great shelter. So not only does it provide berries, it produces, um, it's a berry producing, it has thorns for shelter, and then it attracts insects. As in, the flowers uh, bloom from May and June, and they have this unpleasant odor that actually attracts the pollinators. And you can see the small red kind of palm-like crab apple fruits that persist into winter that are eaten by birds, especially when food sources are becoming scarce, becoming scarce in the winter months. This is a great tree to grow because it has attractive flowers and fruit. It's great for a hedgerow, or you could use it as an accident plant, and it's a great food for birds. Looking at those berries, we'll look at those two different kind of categories of berries. As mentioned from the hawthorn, that was a persistent fruit. It has to go through a period of freezing and thawing repeatedly until it's soft enough to be relished by birds. That's a persistent fruit. That's nature's way of being able to have resources available in the winter. You also have flash fruits, you know, like an apple, just being able to pull it right off the tree and eat it right then and there. Berries and fruits are essential for building up fat reserves for fall migration. So you'll see a lot of berry producing plants at the end of summer, early fall. Some birds that like uh, berries out here, cedar waxwings, your robins, and your bullock orioles are going to be frequent, frequenting your backyard if you have some of these plants. The three-leaf sumac, or the skunk bush, it's a slow-growing deciduous shrub, say about six feet tall and about 10 feet wide. Uh, it flowers from April through June, and same thing has uh, very like fruits that are soft and fuzzy. Native habitat is dry, rocky slopes or canyons along streams and other open areas in the plains, the basins, and the foothills. It is extremely drought and wind tolerant. It can be used to vegetate slopes or the specimen plants. Used for nesting cover by many bird species because of the dense growth form, and it's also grown for fall color in the fruit for birds. Another fantastic tree for producing berries is the hackberry. It's a larger tree reaching about 30 feet, but this is providing that upper canopy, that vertical structure when we're looking at that diversity of layers. It is slow growing, uh, and the flowers are greenish and inconspicuous, and they bloom from about April to September. Native habitat are your dry hills, your canyons, and outcrops in the plains and basins. It is extremely drought and wind tolerant and can tolerate a variety of soils, including alkaline soils, useful for difficult sites or the desert garden. 
Our next food group is nectar, that jolt of energy. We often think of providing food for hummingbirds, but also our insect pollinators. This genre is so big that Penn Simmons have over 150 different plant species and varieties. So I couldn't select just one to talk about. But Penn Simmons are fantastic for any prairie or rock garden. They're beautiful in a mixed perennial border. And they come in a variety of colors and sizes. Some are low forming mats all the way up to about two, two and a half feet tall. They have a very short bloom, uh, bloom period, maybe a week, two, three weeks maximum. So it's best to select a few different varieties so you can have that extended bloom time, looking at the diversity of being able to provide food sources from early fall all the way until late spring. But they're water-wise, and they're great for any prairie garden. The orange butterfly weed, we mentioned that a minute ago. This is fantastic, same thing in a mixed perennial border. It gets to about two, two and a half feet tall. It has these gorgeous orange clusters and they provide these landing pads for butterflies and other pollinators. There's two other types of milkweed, the swamp and the showy. Both of those need to be more in riparian areas, so the orange butterfly weed is the one that you're going to want for your water-wise garden. And it can tolerate a range of soils from clay all the way to sandy. And uh, the mature plants are a little bit difficult to transplant, but they are ideal for a butterfly garden. In the last, food the last food category, nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds also provide that protein, and it's a great winter source for birds. Looking at your pine siskins, or your American goldfinches, or your juncos, or even your pygmy nut hatches will all be coming to your yard to feast on the nuts and seeds. Here's an American goldfinch perched on top of a prairie coneflower. Coneflower is about two feet tall, has these gorgeous drooping down purple flowers. Uh, from July to September. Great for full sun, well-drained soils, extremely drought, drought tolerant, and great for the prairie garden or middle of a perennial border. It is short-lived, but it sells seeds readily. Once you have a few of these, you will have a lot in your garden. So here in the front range, grasses dominate. So it makes sense to include and mimic your natural landscape. Big blue stem is by far my favorite grass uh, because of the height and the texture and the color that it provides. It gets to about six feet tall. It's a red mahogany color in the fall. It's wheat colored in the winter. And then you have the seed heads on top. But there are a variety of other grasses that work well out here. The Indian grass, little blue stem, side oat brahma, or switchgrass in your riparian area. And for maintenance with these guys, you know, this is not like your normal turf grass where you consistently mow them. You just do one mowing a season. If you do, that's in the early spring, and you don't uh, dehead the, the stalks because they have all the seeds that are great food source, uh, seed source throughout the winter. So I'm going to share a little success story for you, switching gears from talking about plants and actually putting it together. How does it make a difference in your community? You know, it's great for you to look at, it's great for the wildlife to enjoy, but how does it all connect together? How does it involve everybody? So Don Ireland, he was a 2014 Ultimate Habitat Hero, and he's the president of the HOA board down at Cherry Creek 3, which is in Denver. It's a 251 unit development. And with changing and renovating the landscaping there, updating the sprinkler heads and toilets. They have saved 15 million gallons of water and $100,000 annually through water saving measures. I'll repeat that. 15 million gallons of water and $100,000 they have saved their neighborhood. And here is the after photo of what that landscaping looks like. So not only is it great for providing habitat, it's water-wise, it's involving the community, but it's also climate-friendly. It makes a direct impact on our carbon footprint. We're directly reducing our greenhouse emissions, especially when we're talking about reducing our lawn or turf grass area because we're extending out those perennial borders. 
Lawnmowers account for up to 5% of our greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., according to the EPA. It also increases carbon storage. Lawns store some carbon, but trees and shrubs store even more, especially, especially your perennial plants. Annuals die every year, so that carbon that they have stored in their tissue just goes back to the soil, whereas your perennial plant will store that in their tissue year after year. It also builds resilient bird populations. Your yard full of native plants provide the food resources birds need to feed their babies, refuel during migration, and survive and thrive during the winter and all year round. There's benefits to people, too. Our philosophy with Audubon is where birds thrive, people prosper. And this couldn't be more true. Native plant landscaping improves the health and our well-being of us. Having a healthy green outdoor space is fundamental to our health, to our families, to our community, and to our wildlife, and to our rivers. It can increase our physical health, going outside and spending time in the garden. It can reduce stress and increase our mental well-being, whether that be reducing our stress or cortisol levels, or just having a clear mind for the day. It can save money, especially if we're not continually buying plants that aren't working well in our garden, saving money on our water bill, saving time. We're not going to be out there mowing our huge lawns every weekend. We can actually now enjoy our garden. Certainly going to increase the property value. Increasing recreation time outside is such a great opportunity for you and the kids to go outside and connect with nature. Increasing that overall quality of life for you, your neighborhood, your community and restoring that vital ecosystem services, talking about pollination, photosynthesis, erosion control, all of which are provided for free by these natural functioning habitats. So we can really see how creating habitat hero gardens are not only helpful for our feathered flyway friends, but our rivers and our own mental health. Hopefully with this spring-like weather, we hope today's presentation encourages you to create water-wise gardens, and we would love to be a resource to help you with your planning efforts. We have a lot of ways for you to stay involved. First, I would encourage you to go to our website listed at the bottom, rockies.audubon.org slash Habitat Heroes. It's a great resource for you to look at our upcoming events, check out events that we have going on, other events going on in the community. Also a great resource to look at our storyboard. We've compiled all our Habitat Hero Gardens, and you can look at their photos and read the stories from their gardeners. Excellent plant sources. And we have a blog that we release every other Wednesday where we have gardening tips and how-tos and invite guest bloggers to share their plants and expertise with us. Also on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter where you can stay abreast our current information for not only our Habitat Hero program, but for our other programs as well. All right. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for all that great information. Um, we have had a couple questions come in, and it looks like we've got some time to entertain them. A couple of them are a little specific, a couple of them are a little bit broad, but I'd like to start with uh, Joy's question. Um, and she asks, would the plants that you recommend work up in the mountains near about 8,500 foot elevation um, near the west end, or the west entrance, rather, Rocky Mountain National Park? That is a fantastic question. I appreciate you asking that. Plants have a specific growing requirement. Every plant has its place. And the, mount, the montane ecosystem is totally different than out here in the short grass prairie. And so we do offer different presentations for those different life zones in Colorado. We have an upcoming, one, uh, uh, upcoming event in Netherlands, so outside of Boulder on June 11th, and that's with the Gilpin County Extension, and they will be talking about how to create gardens at actually the elevation at 8,500 feet. So that would be a perfect event for you to attend. Super. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I've got another uh, very kind of specific question here from Nancy, um, and she says that squirrels eat all of her hawthorn berries, depriving the birds of food and me of birds. Do you have any suggestions? Ah, yes. Squirrels, rabbits, and deer. Those are always going to be our pets. First thing I can offer you is patience. 
you know, our backyards, our front yards, these are living, breathing ecosystems supporting an array and an entire food web. That being said, we still don't want everyone invited to our yard. You can go from one extreme, setting up a, feed, a feeder and offering nuts and seeds to deter your squirrels from going after your plants and going after the things that they really enjoy. That being said, you're going to now call in a lot of squirrels because they love the nuts and the seeds. But you also attract some other birds like your jays uh, and your woodpeckers would enjoy those um, food sources as well. Um, and also dogs. Dogs do a fantastic job of kind of keeping everyone out of the yard. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I encourage you to keep your cats indoors as cats are the ones that will be the killer of uh, many songbirds annually. Oh, good. Very good. Great advice. Um, I just had a question come in from, from Tom, and he is asking, uh, if you wanted to start a 40-foot by 6-foot area of zero scape native plants, what would you do first? Sure. Can you find out, Tom, if, if does that area have turf grass currently, or are you looking at a brand new planting there? Yeah, oh, that's right. We're on right. that's right. Okay, so <laughs> we'll pretend like it does <laughs> we'll pretend like it does have turf grass, which so often is the case because we're gonna be extending that border out. So you do need to kill off the grass, one of the cost effective ways and the great way of uh, killing off grass is laying out a tarp or cardboard newspapers of some sort, leaving that out in the sun for a couple of weeks. That's going to really kill off the grass. And then you can fill up the soil, amend it if you need to, and get it prepared for your planting. To extend out that border to help you get started if you're not a, um, you know, a visual person or can't do the design work on your own. We do offer um, some great pre-planned gardens, or High Country Gardens has some fantastic pre-planned gardens. Or um, you could even look at, we have our Colorado Wildscapes book that walks you through the process. You know, design is certainly a different component than uh, just putting all the elements together. How can you put it together spatially? And that Colorado Wildscapes book can walk you through that design process. And also, uh, for another design uh, tip, on April 9th in Cheyenne, we'll be working with the uh, master gardeners there, and in the afternoon, a hands-on portion will be creating your own wildscape with a uh, hands-on activity of design work for your own garden. Super. We've got another uh, question here from David, and he is asking about um, suggestions, plant suggestions for the pinyon juniper ecosystems in the Colorado River area along I-70. Any suggestions there? Yes. After this call, I can certainly send out. Uh, can you hear me? I can send out a plant list to all of you after this call, since we have your email addresses, that would include all the plant lists for the different life zones of Colorado. And each life zone, we've selected about 20 plants that include a variety of grasses shrubs, and perennials. Great. And also these plant lists can be found on our website, the rockies.audubon.org slash Habitat Heroes. There's a resources page. At the very top, there is a section of downloadable resources, one of which being plant lists for those different life zones. Very good. Okay, we've got a, a quick question here from Jackie. She's asking, uh, what was the name of the book that you recommended by Douglas? called Bringing Nature Home. And all of the research was done uh, in the Eastern Seaboard in Delaware and Pennsylvania, but the principles still apply out here. And he was just a fantastic speaker to have come support the Habitat Hero program back in January. Great book. I would, if you haven't read anything on um, you know, how to create habitat gardens, that would be the first book I would direct someone to. Mm -hmm. Very good. All righty. Um, and so we've got a couple conglomerate questions, and I'm just going to kind of pull them together into one. Um, and the question is that are you working specifically with water providers like Denver Water or Northern uh, to promote conservation through native landscaping? And certainly the HOA success story that you shared, you know, that was a, a, a very um, reaching uh, story about savings in water. And so is there any plans or are you currently working with any water providers? That's a great question. That's certainly definite, that's certainly the growth 
of our Habitat Hero program and a uh, huge opportunity for us to kind of get into that field. And last year we did have a few educational workshops with Denver, or not Denver, sorry, Aurora Water, so outside of Denver. We've not had any conversations yet with Denver Water. That is certainly on our list, especially as more of these success stories come about. You know, it's one thing to have an organization go approach our water company, but it's a totally different thing when it's members of our community that are also behind us and have these wonderful stories and photos and documentation of bringing the community together. Uh, so we'll certainly leverage that as, all, as more of these community members um, take part in this effort. Absolutely. Um, I might take a stab at a, at a question very quickly. I've had several comments about why rain barrels are still illegal in Colorado. <laughs> um, and I do have, I know, <laughs> it's one of the, the pressing water stories, um, certainly of our legislative session this year. Um, so rain barrels are back if you are not um, following the legislative session. Um, you know, there was quite the story about them last year uh, about not being able to be passed. Uh, rain barrels uh, have, again, revisited in this session. They have passed the House, um, and it is, you know, a potential that they will be passing in the Senate. But there is a, a primary um, fear that rain barrels could, one, undermine uh, our prior appropriation water system, and two, might require an augmentation plan. Um, there's tremendous testimony um, from folks at CSU, real experts at CSU, that have stated that, that there will be no noticeable um, difference with the use of rain barrels um, in an urban landscape. So let's hope that, uh, that science prevails and that we can actually get rain barrels across the finish line this year. Okay. All right, so Jamie, here's a, a, another quick one uh, for you also talking about irrigation. Um, does, uh, this is from Sherry. Uh, does irrigation need to be set up for watering a water wise or habitat hero garden? That is a great question. That was one of the water wise tips was the irrigation. You know, the best thing that you could do if you have a smaller property is water by hand. Obviously, that's not as conducive if you have a vegetable garden or a larger property. The drip irrigation is the best option because it's watering at the root. It's watering at the source versus a uh, sprinkler overhead. And it has the capability of being able to be turned on and off uh, timers as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Yeah. We've got a question here from, uh, from John. We've got that time for about like just two more questions. Um, this one being from uh, John. Um, and he's talking about the use of peat moss and looking at, um, you know, when you were suggesting adding organic matter to soil. Um, could you comment on any of the issues of peat moss uh, mining um, that might damage or hurt wetlands from where they're extracted from? Is there any, um, do you have any information on that? Oh, goodness. That, that, Abby, that is a question I don't think I could answer. I could certainly look into that and follow up with you. Um, but off my current knowledge and the, the articles that I have read, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that effectively. No problem. John, that sounds like a great follow-up conversation between you and Jamie. So that one's coming along. Um, and let's, uh, let's take this as our last question. Unless you have a hot burning question, please go ahead and fire it into the chat session. Um, and we can entertain that. Um, we have a question here that says that I am physically unable to do the renovation of my quarter acre lot. Uh, do you recommend any native landscaping contractors or services that could um, do this for me? And I'm not yes. quite sure the physical location here. So, <laughs> sure. So that is a great question. You know, uh, some people don't have either the, the physical capabilities or the, the visual conceptual part of designing, and certainly help and those resources are required or sometimes very necessary especially if it needs to get approved by a board and a covenant controlled so we have started working alongside landscape designers that are reputable the first one i could recommend her name is carla too she's with green roots garden design and all of her gardens that she designed are habitat gardens so she has a great uh, knowledge of the plants here in fort collins so i'm not sure necessarily where you're located but she works up here in northern colorado uh, great knowledge of the plants, great knowledge of how to create water-wise gardens and creating those habitat gardens. Another resource is, her name is Jenny Burkhalter, 
And we, both, we have both of these landscape designers listed on the resources page on our website. And Jenny Burkhalter is helping us uh, design some demonstration gardens as well, one of which being over at Houston Gardens. And it's about that size, about a half an acre. Uh, so those are the two that I would point you in up here in northern Colorado. If you're in a different part, feel free, if you're a different part of Colorado or a different state, feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to do a little bit of research on my behalf and figure out maybe a good uh, source or starting point for sure. Fantastic. That's terrific. Well, folks, I want to thank Jamie for all her work in preparing for this great webinar and her work on behalf of helping people to create native habitats and lessening the burden on rivers by reducing our residential uh, water consumption. And I'd like to extend an invitation to you that if you're not already a member of Audubon's Western Rivers Action Network to join, it's a great way to stay informed on future webinars. Um, Audubon's partnership with Wildlands Restoration Volunteers to physically participate in some hands-on riparian restoration projects. We've got collaborative engagement opportunities and just so much more. Also, please do check out Habitat Heroes website for additional ways to make a difference in your residential water footprint, as well as create aesthetic and ecological native habitats. And lastly, thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us and making our winter webinar series a great success. We hope that you found this information useful. And as always, there's much more to come. We hope you enjoy join us again soon. And have a great rest of your day. And Jamie, thanks again. Thank you all. I hope you have a fantastic day. And after this snow hits us, I hope you all can start enjoy uh, designing and planning your gardens that are water wise and help birds, people, and our rivers. Absolutely. Thank you all. Have a great day.